Another person leading the way is Maya Solovitz. She is our keynote speaker tonight. So I had a chance to connect with Maya a few days ago, and I can tell you she is as bright as she is passionate. You're going to get the straight truth from Maya tonight. She is an award-winning author and a journalist who covers addiction and neuroscience. Many of you have read her latest book. It's called Unbroken Brain, where she uses her own story of recovery from heroin and cocaine addiction to explore how reframing conversations about addiction can transform prevention, treatment, and policy. So rather than a typical keynote speech, Maya and I have decided to have a conversation. And Maya, I've had a chance to talk with you a couple of times over the past week, and I am so grateful that you're here tonight. And I know that everyone in the audience is going to get so much out of what you have to say. So it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Maya, why don't we start with your personal story? I, I was so compelled to hear what your life experience was and is and how you're using that to make a difference in the world. Why don't you give us a brief snapshot of that? Sure. Um, so basically, I was a really strange, geeky, weird kid who couldn't figure out how to connect with people and discovered that drugs were a special interest that people actually did want to hear me talk about a lot. And so, you know, opera and science fiction wasn't exactly doing that very well. Um, and when I found drugs, people wanted to hear it. People wanted to connect. They allowed me to feel better about myself and I was off and running. I wound up um, at Columbia and I wound up selling cocaine and I wound up getting arrested. And I was facing a 15 to life uh, mandatory minimum under New York's Rockefeller laws at the time. And because I'm basically white and female and was in an Ivy League school, I managed to not do that sentence. And since that time, and since I got into recovery, I've really felt that it is just outrageous the way we treat people who use drugs and the way racism pervades every single aspect of our drug policy. And it's taken me a long time to understand exactly how deep this goes. But the reality is that we have this idea that our drug laws were made with some scientific rationale or some you know, reason that this is illegal and that isn't. But the actual reason is racism. And until we understand that, we're not gonna end up having better policy because we're going to continue to stigmatize and target some people while allowing other people to have access to safe, pure substances uh, and treatment without prison. Maya, a lot of our institutions in this country have been tainted and shaped by racism. How has drug policy, how did that start out? How did racism shape drug policy from the beginning uh, in this country? Sure, well, if you look at how things became illegal, it's incredible how much racism there is in it. So when the first laws against opium were made in San Francisco, I believe in the 1800s, these were about fears related to Chinese railroad workers. And supposedly they were gonna use opium to rape white women. Um, when we started having laws against cocaine, the fears were related to black men seducing white women. Uh, when it was marijuana, there was panic over jazz musicians and Mexicans seducing white women. Can we sense a theme here? I mean, it's just like, and I mean, I say this slightly sarcastically, but when you look at the headlines from the Times, and literally from the New York Times, there's a headline about Negro cocaine fiends. The racism is just so blatant in all of the run-ups to all of the illegalizations of various substances. I mean, the only drug policy we have that isn't very visibly tainted by racism is the foundation of the FDA, which regulates medical drugs. But everything else comes out of these series of panics. I mean, even alcohol prohibition was a panic over immigration. And the KKK was actually one of the biggest supporters of alcohol prohibition. So it goes like, it's just very obvious as soon as you look at the history. Um, and then of course, that's even before you get to Nixon using the Southern strategy to signal to white racists that he would be tough on crime. 
Um, so, you know, then it goes into Reagan, et cetera, et cetera. And so there, it's just like, it's just all there, but we have always talked about it as though drugs are bad and we must protect the children without ever looking at this stuff. So I think the irony, my a lot of people would say, you, know, you look at the state of Washington and others that have legalized marijuana, and yet we have a substantial number of people who are of color who have been sentenced to long prison terms for simple marijuana possession or dealing marijuana. Um, how much further do we have to go to, to try to get to a place of reality when it comes to the enforcement of drug laws in this country? Well, I mean, my feeling is we have to start from scratch and figure out what, you know, what we mean when we talk about drugs. I feel like, you know, alcohol is a drug, tobacco is a drug, caffeine is a drug. We don't call them drugs and we don't call ourselves users for showing up at Starbucks or even better coffee shops, <laughs> you know, every day for that exact same hit, right? Um, so uh, we need to set policy based on science. And science tells us that addiction is compulsive drug use that continues in the face of negative consequences. That means that using punishment to stop addiction is exactly the thing that will not work. And so if we want to have humane and anti-racist drug policy, we have to decriminalize and we have to figure out a way to balance the problems of having commercial marketing. We really don't want Philip Morris fentanyl on every street corner, right? Although that you would at least know the dosage, right? <laughs> but um, so in order to, you know, to deal with the trade-offs between commercialization and prohibition, we need to find the sweet spot in the middle. That's gonna take a long time. But in the meanwhile, we need to recognize that people who use drugs are humans who deserve life just like everybody else. And we should not be, using these racist stereotypes to stigmatize drug users and also people of color. I think this is a really good time to get into this next topic. And a lot of you in the audience have heard this term before, harm reduction as a strategy. So harm reduction is a strong theme in your book, Unbroken Brain. Tell us what harm reduction is and why it's better than the approaches that we've used until now. Sure, so harm reduction is the idea in drug policy that we should focus on reducing harm to people, not stopping people from getting high. I personally don't care if you have euphoria, earned or unearned. In fact, I would like you to have euphoria because I think I'm a nice person. But um, the, you know, what we should care about is, is your getting high hurting yourself or somebody else? That's where government and society has a role, not in are you getting extra pleasure? And so harm reduction simply focuses on how do we reduce the harm? And when policy is judged based on how much harm it causes and how much harm it prevents, our current policy looks terrible. Our current policy tries to be measured by how much drugs are seized and um, you know things like this. But the reality is we have a horrible overdose crisis. We have a horrible level of addiction and we have not stopped people from taking drugs. Meanwhile, we have our prisons full. So this policy is doing a ton of harm and no appreciable good. And what harm reduction says is, okay, there's a better way. Let's look at what things are harmful. And so it starts in the HIV pandemic and people realize that it's being spread by needles. And you know, first it's like, oh my God, we're gonna give needles to addicts and people are freaking out. But the reality is of course, that a dead person cannot recover. And People are already using drugs. We don't have enough treatment for them. People relapse all the time. And needle exchange actually gets more people into treatment. So if you participate in needle exchange, you're not less likely to get treatment, you're more likely to get treatment. So that kind of explodes all of our current thinking about drugs. It says, wait a minute, people who are using actually are making healthy choices and can move towards recovery. And if you treat them with compassion and respect, they start to treat themselves that way. So um, harm reduction goes from this like sort of uh, abstract philosophical idea to radical compassion very quickly. Yeah, I'm, you know, the current strategy, we have more than a few people in this country that want uh, drug users and drug sellers especially to be punished. Um, you know, in the city of Seattle, we've had, you know, a pretty robust debate over where to locate a needle exchange program. 
if you could sit next to one of these get tough on drugs people, Maya, what would you tell that person to try to bring them to the point of view of harm reduction as opposed to just, I mean, let's face it, people get sent to prison and they can get drugs in prison and, and many times they're not getting the treatment they need. So what would you tell that person? Well, if they were a fiscal conservative, I would say, do you want to continue wasting billions of dollars? <laughs> because this isn't working, right? Um, I would also just start by saying that we know what the definition of addiction is. It's agreed upon by all of the scientific and medical authorities. It is compulsive drug use that continues in the face of negative consequences. In other words, punishment isn't going to stop it. So let's use things that are going to help. I would also talk about the history of trauma and mental illness that the vast majority of people with addiction have. If you listen to the stories of people with addiction, they are painful. They are not about, oh, I was just having so much fun. I wanted to be a bad, selfish person and mug people. You know, they're about, I lost my mother when I was three. My father shot my sister. I got raped. I mean, you start to listen to half of these stories, particularly of women who are homeless, and you're halfway through the story and you want to get high because it's just so awful. Um, so when we understand that this comes from pain, it does not come from a desire for like extra joy. It comes from a desire to just feel okay and do okay in a world that in a world that's oppressing you. So when we understand why people are doing what they're doing and why it looks so bizarre and that it's not about I'm lazy and I don't want to work. I mean, it's a lot of work to be an active person with addiction. Um, if you can get that energy transferred towards productive stuff, we can do amazing things. Because if you're able to persist despite consequences, that's also what you need to succeed in very high level careers because you've got to get rejected all the time. At least I do as a writer, right? So, um, you know, so I would just talk about, you know, what's going on for these people? Why are they behaving in this way that appears to be so appalling and what's the most practical and effective way to help and cost effective mm. and i would also say do you probably know somebody who has a child with addiction if that was your child do you think that putting in putting them in jail would solve that if that was your child and your child had an eating disorder do you think putting them in jail every time they ate a donut would fix it like we don't treat any disease this way we have to come clean and say, we see this as a sin or say, okay, we really do believe this is a medical problem and actually treat it that way and get jail out of the picture. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that if people are doing things that are harming other people, that there's no accountability for that. But putting drug possession and, you know, but it's fine to have alcohol does not make any sense. So in your book, Maya, and in a lot of your reporting, you talk about how addiction has not really been fully explained as a medical condition. I feel like we, I mean, just in the last, you know, recent years, we've come to think of addiction as not just a weakness, you know, of morals, but of an actual medical condition. From a scientific standpoint, what do we know about addiction now? I mean, a lot has transpired in 30 years since you started. What do we know about addiction today and what, what do we need to know when it comes to the science of addiction? Right. So to me, what always confused me and what is very confusing is that people with addiction are hugely varied. We have this idea that if you talk to one person with addiction, you've talked to all of us and I can speak for everybody with addiction, which we wouldn't say I can speak for everybody with red hair. So why should we say that about addiction, right? It doesn't make sense. Um, but when we look at what really goes on with addiction. It's basically a learning issue. You are not learning from punishment. Um, and so what's going on there? Why do we have situations where people do persist in this compulsive sort of way? What does this look like in the rest of our life? Well, it kind of looks a lot like the way people behave when they're in love and the way people behave when they are trying to take care of their child. They will persist and do very irrational things to make sure that they can be with their loved ones and they can care for their loved ones. But if you get that misdirected towards a drug, um, it ends up being deeply problematic. So I see this as a problem that occurs during development because it's interesting, it starts in adolescence in 90% of the cases. 
And gee, that's at the same time when you're developing these parts of the brain involved in these um, you know, nurturing and mating systems. So let's look at it that way. It's not this crazy alien, alien thing. We've all had <laughs> crazy romantic experiences for the most part. And you know, if we see that, we can say, okay, your brain isn't broken. Your brain just learned something very deeply because if you think about how intense it is when you are missing that person, but we've learned this thing very deeply and now we need to learn something else. And now we need another source of connection and joy and purpose. And so that's a very brief version of uh, <laughs> how I see it and how the science really shows that it works within the brain because it is acting on these same areas that are involved in the systems I was just discussing. Ah, that would explain my addiction to Netflix when I get home from work at night. <laughs> all those all those shows that I watch. Um, Maya, what keeps you in recovery? I, I read that you don't like to use the word you know, sober or clean because of some of the baggage that comes along. But I like the word recovery. What what keeps you in recovery? What inspires you? Sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, because I don't like clean because it implies dirty. This is also why I don't like the term substance abuse, because that also applies that you're abusing the drug and you're an abuser and you're a bad person. We need to get rid of that. We also need to get rid of dependence because dependence isn't the problem. We're all interdependent. Um, but anyway, what inspires me is that I have a sense of meaning and purpose in doing the work that I do. I have a husband and a cat, two cats actually that I love. I don't want to leave out the second cat. Um, and, um, you know, I have a life that's worth living now. Um, I have friends who I love. I have family who I love, who love me. And it's, you know, I can feel that now. I'm also no longer profoundly depressed and I take antidepressants, which helps. And I say that because a lot of times people think relying on medication means you're like not really in recovery or something like this. And for me, it happens to be Prozac and Wellbutrin, but for anybody else, it might be methadone or buprenorphine or any of a million things. And that's fine. It doesn't make you a lesser human being of any sort. You know, we're just wired differently and different people need different things and that's okay. That's what gives human life the variety. And that's what also gives us a variety of different talents. Um, one final question for you, Maya, before we move on. This has been so fun. Um, you mentioned earlier that your experience with the criminal justice system would have been very different had you not been white. Um, talk a little bit more about drug laws and how these drug laws currently impact people of color in this country. I mean, it's just horrendous. Like literally when um, I was facing that court case, I was the only white defendant in the room many times. And I certainly wasn't the only white person selling Coke. Um, you know, I mean, you know, it just, it's awful. And it makes me feel horribly guilty to this day because we haven't stopped it. Um, it you know, and, and what really, the tragedy of it to me, the most of the tragedy of it to me is like, there are people who are talented and kind and wonderful and loving who we're wasting their lives away. We're not allowing them to use their talents to fix the real problems we have in society right now or to make the music that we love or to make art or to write or to do whatever. We're just wasting all this talent. You know, if you if you talk to um, you know, people living in these homeless encampments, some of them are just brilliant. And it's like, why? Why do we do this? Why do we throw people away? Why do we just like have these categories like race um, where we just feel like, okay, we're going to, you know, it's just wrong. So I hope that, um, you know, I, I think the marijuana legalization thing is a great step in the right direction because it shows us for one that we can do this without the world collapsing, although COVID was not to do with marijuana. Um, and um, nor was the other thing. But um, the, you know, we need to continue to recognize that these laws are not a way of protecting children, but they're a way of protecting white supremacy and we've got to stop it. Maya, it's been so fun talking with you. We're honored that you are here. Um, just search for Maya in social media and you can follow her on all the various platforms. Um, I want to just end our conversation with this, Maya. I've interviewed you know, literally thousands of people in my 30 plus year career and I can tell you to a person, my favorite people in the world 
are people who have experienced tragedy or loss or hardship and have taken that experience to do good. And when I look at you, I look at someone who could have checked out after what happened to you earlier in your career. But what you did is you turned it around and you've turned it into a gift for all of us. And I really appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you.